want to introduce our next uh, our next panelist, uh, who I I suspect everyone uh, in this uh, this room knows or uh, knows about. Uh, John, welcome. <laughs> John Helliwell is a CFAR senior fellow and co-director of CFAR's program in social interactions, identity, and well-being. Uh, he is one of the world's leading researchers into the social and the economic components of happiness, and he is a pioneer in incorporating well-being into economic models, and we're so proud of him in this city for doing that, aren't we? Um, he is co-editor of the World Happiness Report 2015, which will be released in New York City in a couple of days on April the 23rd. Dr. Halliwell John is also Professor Emeritus of Economics at the Vancouver School of Economics at UBC. And um, probably if you've turned on your radio or television or Twitter feed or <laughs> whatever today, you would realize that he's in high demand today as a result of the study that was recently re released. But I think he's in high demand generally and he is getting ready to release the World Happiness Report in New York on 30, Thursday. So, John, welcome. Please welcome John Helliwell. Thank you, thank you, Al. Am I, <coughs> am I audible? <laughs> Credible? <laughs> you want the evidence first, don't you? I, I want to run, run a little experiment first. Uh, are you happy? Some of you know how to run the rest of the experiment. <laughs> I'll, I'll just see whether you all do or not. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you, no, you don't. The experienced audience knows that the experiment is not complete until we've all sung the song and clapped our hands together. Are you with me? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Now, my colleagues have given away most of the answers that I'm about to give you, but the next question is, are you happier now than you were two minutes ago? In general, the answer to that question is yes, and it's certainly not my singing voice. It's because we were singing together. And it's that mere fact, and there's lots of lab experiments showing precisely that. The second point of that experiment is to say that's a very specific definition of happiness. You knew exactly what I was asking, and you knew how to answer it. This was the emotional definition of happiness, which was already talked about. The kind of happiness that we're going to be discussing in most of the rest of our time here is a relational form, a cognitive form. Say, are you happy with your life as a whole? You're using your mind in a quite different way, and you don't just, it's not how I'm feeling at the moment, it's I think about my life as a whole and come back with the answers. Some people have used the fact that these two different definitions of happiness are different to poo-poo the whole business. Fortunately, these two definitions, when asked of people, they know exactly the conversational context in which they're asked and they give the right answers. So the answers to the relational question come back with a strong dependence on life circumstances. The happiness ones comes back, the emotional ones, come back with a strong dependence on whether they've just sung a silly children's song. See, if that changed your whole life view, then you'd worry about the nature of the question about <laughs> your life view. <laughs> You with me? So those two things are, are very different and they are mutually supportive, not antagonistic. Uh, the second point I want to make, quite different from the first, is that I'm very happy to be here and uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, see the wonderful colleagues we get to work with and second, uh, to celebrate uh, and thank CIFAR for the being able to make this possible. There are two nice links with CIFAR. First, CIFAR has supported all the research that made this possible. I, I say with some truth, the World Happiness Report simply wouldn't exist in anything like the form it had had CIFAR not been on the scene as one of its sponsors, more, most specifically through our research. The second is that we in the Social Interactions Program, who are major beneficiaries of this collaborative research, live off it in two ways. 
Uh, one, it has enabled us to build an interdisciplinary program. Imagine studying happiness if you came from one discipline, right? You couldn't possibly do it, right? And you certainly couldn't have done it if you'd started from economics and only were using what you learned in economics. <laughs> so we have in our program psychologists, political scientists, epidemiologists, you name it. People who are able to drop their egos at the door, come in and work together for 10 years, right? That you don't learn how to do this overnight and are then able to do this. Now, you may have heard of CIFAR 2.0. The notion of what we're building, CIFAR is building in the future, is going beyond the fundamental research that was in all these programs initially and saying, you know, if we're really going to change the way knowledge changes and changes the world, we've got two more elements we want to add. One is reaching abroad in order to make international connections and learn from others and help them. And the other is to make connections with the community so that we can make links between the academic research and what's done in practice. So you can see how the partners involved in this panel represent our attempt within this program to do precisely that. But what are we missing in this panel? What we're missing is what's in the audience. Because quite specifically, we invited some deliberately and some just hoping you'd come, people who care about this city and care a lot about it and have a variety of rich experiences about how you can make life in a big city better. Now, now that you've seen Grant's figures, you know there are challenges in big cities, right? All those ones at the bottom were big cities. Now, a number of people, you know, people in the media take cameras out into the streets and they say, what do you think of this finding from StatCan? And there's two immediate answers they tend to get. I haven't watched all the stuff, but I've seen a couple of them. Uh, one is, it's a bad survey. <laughs> The only people who answer happiness surveys are unhappy people, so, especially in Vancouver, I guess you'd have to say. Uh, but of course, from what you, you've heard from Grant, you know that's not the case. These are qu questions built into the middle of a, of a Canadian community health survey. Uh, and, the, and, uh, and the other one is to get cross and say, we are not unhappy here. Uh, this, is a very <laughs> this is a very happy city. <laughs> That's a non duchesne smile I just gave you. The, the Duchesne smile is the authentic smile. So the first thing I have to tell people who are acting in either of those ways is first of all to tell them about the survey and then to say, you know, if you took the Vancouver number and put it into the World Happiness Report ranking of countries, where do you think Vancouver would sit? I'm going to put it into the ladder from the World Happiness Report 2013 because 2015 is still embargoed. <laughs> but put it into the last list. Where do you think Vancouver would sit? In the top dozen. Of Saguenay Sajon being the top one, two or three. So what that's saying is, and they're very tight at the top of that distribution, everyone in Canada is pretty happy. Any of the communities you can think of are pretty happy. We're bound in a very narrow bound. But these are still, because of this sample of a third of a million people, we can start getting into the fine points. Well, the fine points is where the data really starts speaking to you. We're now saying, let's talk about different kinds of communities and then ask, how they differ, and it was quite apparent, right? All the, all the evidence we have from around the world is what really makes a difference to people's lives is uh, three secrets to happiness. The reason I don't have a, uh, an overhead is I've got three secrets, and if you put your secrets on the overhead, they're, they're hardly <laughs> secrets, right? Uh, <laughs> so don't let this get out. <laughs> uh, one of them is the vital importance of trust. Well, it turns out the trust is uh, greases every wheel that needs greasing, but more important, you're really happy in an environment where you think your wallet will be returned. The other is that the power of generosity to make you happy as well as to big, build better communities. Now that's a very new finding within the <laughs> happiness research and, and, and the psychologists in our program have been some of the leaders in, in, in doing that uh, research. The third one, which I've sort of tried to bring a bunch of things together is the power of collaboration. So it really is this, it isn't just company, it's doing things and it's doing things together. Okay. Back up to Aristotle, right? What did Aristotle say about all this? Because I'm, in this context, my interpretation, I'm an Aristotelian of the strongest sort. 
He said you should do just what Grant does, go out and ask people in a reflective mood to think of their life as a whole and come back with a scale. He said, you know, I think I know what would make them happy, would give a high value to that. And he listed all those factors that showed up in Grant's equation. Aristotle was pretty good, no data, good insights. But then the next point, he said, a really good life is then buttressed on one side by a balance of positive emotions. And here that's another, it's not one of my three secrets, but it's a really important result from this research. The presence of positives, wildly more important than the absence of negatives. If you think how we run healthcare, justice systems, almost anything you want, we're busy, anti-harassment policies, you name it, we're busy trying to find negatives and stop them rather than identifying the things that can be positive and building them. And of course, in the process of stopping negative things, we're stopping many more important positive things. You think of the number of innovations that don't happen because there's a rule that says you can't do it. Somebody thought there was a good idea for that rule. So looking ahead, because my time is fleeting, so I'm going to make sure you get a couple of bottom line pieces out of this, <laughs> to roll back the climate of trust reducing overhead that is affecting so many of our institutions' abilities to innovate has got to be part of what we think. So taking risks to promote innovation by making it easy for people to operate at the scale I'm going to say they should be offer operating at and to operate successfully. So that's going to be a really important part of the story. All right, so I've got Arist Aristotle with the center core. And I've got supported by positive emotions, which are more important than the absence of the negatives. And the only thing I'm missing is purpose. Now this comes in as a so-called eudaimonic approach uh, to happiness. And Aristotle said, this was his bow, he had the stoic side of him and he had the uh, Epicurean side. And he was in this golden mean in the middle that the sense of purpose is really important and the data support every element of that. So it's really important. So we're talking now how about make cities better, right? This is really what we're here today for. So uh, the first, I've got three classes of things to be said. One is individual things, what can you do in your own life? And the other is what can we do in our jobs and institutions? And the other is what government should be doing. Uh, and of course, I'm going to be slim on all of those because that's the audience drawn here. You've got better examples than I have. Mike had some good examples. They're drawing them from uh, around the world. The principles we should apply in developing these ideas is that they should be collaborative, they should be experimental, and they should be small scale. Well, now that those are all liberating things, right? It doesn't mean, doesn't mean you've got to get a cabinet to say things can get better, it means you can start right away. And it start means ha having a conversation in your next elevator ride. It means smiling on the street where you otherwise wouldn't. It means making a connection where you otherwise wouldn't. It means walking kids to school when you otherwise would drive them. But more importantly, when you collaborate with others, you then say, no, it's not just me doing this. Let's have a carpool, a walking pool going to school. So you then create social events where they didn't happen at the same time you're getting more socialized, healthier kids. Well, you could see how you could think of those kind of changes in almost every day-to-day -day activity you work. There are many applications within the healthcare system and uh, in education and elsewhere.